Ladies and gentlemen, um, I wish you a very good day. I hope uh, you are fine and um, you enjoy being here. Um, welcome to a new lecture, um, another topic with Hannes. Uh, who, to all who don't know me, I'm Hannes Schramm. I'm the Cultural Property Protection Officer of the Office of Cultures, Cultural Affairs in the Principality of Liechtenstein. And today um, I have... Um, to present to you the topic monitoring and revision of disaster risk management plans. When regarding this topic and of the expression disaster risk management plans, I'd had, had a hard time to imagine anything like such plans. Um, but all in all, uh, it's nothing else than an emergency management plan. Because emergency management, as most of you maybe already saw, uh, consists of different phases where such a plan is part of. So, um, and even the risk management is, plan, plan, uh, is part of, we have to conduct before doing a plan actually. So this is um, an important an important thing to, to um, have in mind. So <clears throat> as I was talking about the emergency management before, you already wrote, uh, uh, saw in, in, in these graphics where Risk management can be found where a plan uh, gets on the ground um, and where an operation according to plan is to be conducted. But I'm going to jump into that again for those who uh, don't remember. So um, what I'm going to talk about is um, monitoring and revision itself. Um, all in all, uh, what does it mean? Where can it be found in the emergency management process and when it is conducted, followed by the part, how it should look like, uh, um, for this is necessary to determine priorities and conduct a threat and risk assessment. So I'm losing some words on that. And in the end, uh, we jump back on the monitoring and revision again, um, what it means and what, what has to be done and, um, maybe also how small recipe, how to, how to do it and how to define it. Um, in the last presentation, I already mentioned the emergency management process, which, ru which runs here linear, but um, somehow also circular. So when we went through the different phases, like here, um, the normal um, condition, the normal phase, event phase, the recovery phase, the normal, uh, normal phase, we are the... Um, uh, so that, that it goes back again. So the, the aim of the whole process of all the circular system is to go back into the, uh, uh, into a normal phase in the normal condition, um, that we have right now. Most likely we will not achieve that anymore, but mm, quite similar to right now. So beginning, you have to imagine that, um, before an event starts, before an event takes place, it would best, uh, would be best to have already conducted damage prevention. Um, how do we do that? We do that with a risk assessment, which we'll see um, some slides later, um, by combining the probability of an event um, to take place um, and the maximum damage this event can cause. Uh, then we have risks and the risk management process also defines then what to do uh, to cope with such risks. So meaning to minimize them. Because in the event, these risks are going to be not only risks, but also then the threat which comes true. So, um, and the damage that comes true. So after an event, and after this chaos phase, which, which takes place directly after the event, it's all about damage minimization and then uh, damage re reduction by doing intervention, however that looks like, with an emergency first response organization, with us, um, uh, with cultural property protection specialists, uh, who, uh, care about, um, um, uh, areas which are affected and so on. And therefore, it's necessary to have plans, um, emergency management plans, more or less. Um, they also show us how to, um, conduct measures like protection measures, safeguarding measures, security and securing measures, and stabilization measures. And these actually are all the topics we have to go through to um, to end this um, event phase, 
more or less, because what we try to reach is um, the condition that we are able to um, decide in a free way and with, uh, uh, with, in, uh, with enough time what to do next. So the whole phase here is um, um, is uh, characterized with, with with pressure, with chaos that uh, we have to take decision. Otherwise, uh, decisions. Otherwise, the damage will get bigger or uh, expand, or the event will expand. And um, this phase is then over when we are able to stop the whole thing and then decide by our own will and with our time we need what we are going to do next. Then uh, begins the recovery phase. The recovery phase, um, there is about damage, uh, damage management, the re recuperation, meaning go um, reaching um, um, in an end state, the state status we had before, which we are not able to, but um, we try to get a quite similar one. Uh, and the methods for that are um, measures of restoration and reconstruction, that's clear. And after that is finished, we are again in the normal phase. We can run normal business. And then it's again about a risk management process we have here in the beginning. And then we are, there we jump in in the monitoring and revision. When we have the monitoring, it's interesting to have more or less a, a, a look on these two phases, how they are conducted, how they were conducted to do it better than. Meaning here we are planning, here we are conducting the plan. and the end, we are just doing some kind of lessons learned, lessons identified to see uh, what we can do better next time and bring that in again in the range, uh, uh, risk management process. For that, in this risk management process, it's first of all very important to set priorities, to determine, uh, to determine priorities. When regarding a collection of cultural objects, it, it's uh, always advantageous um, to, to reflect about how important and worthful objects are creating a ranking or a categorization helps very much, uh, like we have it here. So oh, sorry for the interruption. So step in again. Um, sentence creating a ranking or uh, a categorization helps very much in the further steps of the management, uh, emergency management process when it comes to risk management and emergency planning, as it reduces the workload itself. Because um, if I have to cope with the whole, um, uh, with, with the whole collection, um, most likely I'm not able to finish the whole planning. But I have, if I have a prioritization of a category about which it's the meaningful, uh, um, the most meaningful uh, object or the, uh, object category, I can care about that, so I can prioritize. Um, and it's important to realize, and that's the thing, that um, you can't save and rescue and protect everything, so you have to focus. Going through several aspects um, that help us prioritizing, um, helps, uh, helps us reducing more or less um, um, uh, these categories. So we can have a look on cultural historical significance. We can have a look on the uh, scientific exploration. If it's unexplored, if it's um, or if it's well recorded, the importance in the inventory, completed, is it completing, is it solitary in the inventory, rarity about the condition and or completeness. And yes, these are more or less one, two, three, four, five um, aspects we have to take into account. And um, we can just rate them with a plus and minus. But if it's a plus, it's one star. If it's no plus, if it's a minus, it's no star. And in the end, I have a sum of stars at maximum five, four, three, two, one. And then I have categories. So that's a very easy um, uh, way to to um, um, to prioritize. One point is very important to know when we talk about cultural property, if it's about monetary value, that doesn't matter for us. Because monetary value can purely be handled uh, with um, insurance contracts, but um, one is not able to replace meaning. So it's about meaning. It's not about worth and it's not about value. It's about meaning uh, in this process. So. This whole process is intentionally simplified. 
that's important to know because um uh the whole um the term determining pro uh, priorities process is um, um constructed and uh invented in our um C uh, cultural property protection guideline which is available for every um owner of cultural property and every owner of cultural property should be able to conduct a uh, prioritization process so um after that uh we also do sporadic reassessments so to reduce again and again and again um now it comes to an event now it comes to the incident and this uh makes it a little bit more complicated because when it comes to an incident we have to have in mind that priorities will be settled differently no matter uh what we have assessed before the thing is that the incident will always set the pri priorities for us first of all we do not have influence on what will happen when to the objects in our collection we do not have influence on where the incident has the most effect and only a uh, little influence how emergency force responders like the fi like firefighters uh, proceed in the incident area so they have different priorities from ours as you can see here first of all mankind animals um uh eco ecology and in the end it's about worth it's about values it's about meaning uh and that's very very important to know but that uh doesn't make our uh previous steps um superfluous it helps us very much um when we have to decide what has to be done in the affected area first and what second and what third so about the ranking but it is not always about the most meaningful because if the incident takes place in an area where the non prioritized objects are um stored then it's about saving the non priorities objects and the others can be handled later um nevertheless such assessments help us to determine necessary measures together with the incident manager because when we are prepared and we know what is located where we can also support the incident manager from the firefighters with information Uh, the next part we're going through is the threat and risk assessment. So after we set our priorities, we can, um, uh, regarding them, we can uh, determine um, the threats which um, most likely will affect these prioritized um, collection uh, or, or, or object. This one has to be conducted regularly. Um, and for sure also after an incident so we always have to have in mind because environment changes um equipment changes organization changes as soon as we have there a change we have to conduct the whole process again this is this is important to have uh, to be aware of threats and of uh, risks which um um which lie on us so um on identifying threats for example, in our guideline, we have three um, categories. The first of all, first of all, we have the natural and built environment. There it is about surrounding and location of uh, of the object. We have to assess. It's about natural threats uh, where we have maps available um, in the geodata system. Uh, it's about traffic lines, um, railways, streets, which run near or far by or directly through uh, the objects. It's about industry. It's about um, um, an economy itself, which is um, maybe uh, around this object, because you have to imagine they work with chemicals, with stored chemicals. They work with um, working processes, which maybe cause a threat to, to the object. Uh, then we have to assess construction features um which is the what what is the material used uh is it a stable uh, and 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 um material which is used to the area and also adapted to the area um and the threats which occur in the area like um is it a safe a safe um uh, has it a standard in uh, uh in relation to earthquakes or something like that 
what is the type of structure and everything like that. So structural condition, it's also about um, we have a, a close look on stability of the object. Maybe we need there's some expertise from um, um, from a planning uh, planning office. Um, is there decay? Um, is this object declined? Um, is maintenance be done regularly or not? Um, do are there improvised um, um, settings around which stabilize the object and so on? Um, then we come to the technical environment. So it's about facility service systems, um, how it is heated, what. Uh, how it is, how is the water supply, uh, where is it running through? It's about safety and uh, security systems like alert systems for fire, smoke detection, water detection, um, um, earthquake detection, and so on. What do we have um, as technical protection systems available in in the object or for the object? Are there air conditioned rooms? Um, do we have conservation systems around? Is it yeah, is it prepared? Is it is it is it um, appropriate for storing objects, for example, um, and so on? This has to be um, this has to be the, to be uh, assessed. And what's very important also the way of an alert. If, for example, an alert um, is activated, it's interesting if it runs directly to the police or to a coordination center, or first of all to a security organization, which first sends uh, some um, security um, provider, more or less, uh, who has a look on the situation and then activates maybe police and the uh, uh, coordination center in the, in the police. Um, that um, is nothing bad if something like that is. It's also, uh, it's only somehow sometimes um, um, quite rational because imagine uh, um, an alarm going off two or three or four times a day and every time of that the firefighters which are volunteers in, in our area are alarmed. So we have to have systems in mind how to deal with that. Good. Then we have organizational environment. It's about the ownership itself, uh, who takes care of it, how is the caretaking itself, how is facility management conducted? It's about responsibilities. Who is there? Who is in such an object? Who is responsible for the object? Embedded institution in object. For example, if you have a collection building, if you have a storage building where we have collections inside, which organizations are inside, what is their aim, and so on. And what are political and administrative and insurance structures where um, this object is embedded in. The next part we go through. Um, <clears throat> is then when we uh, determine our uh, determine our our threats, we can um, assess our risks, and that's easy. First of all, after the identification of threats and risks, we do the risk assessment and the evaluation. Then we do the risk uh, mitigation, uh, prevention, and coping, and afterwards supervision, control of measures. Um, so as we see, we are already in the middle of this threat and risk assessment process. Um, in the next step, we take our threat. Um, we put it always into relation with the four main uh, uh, um, um, main threats, like a uh, fire, like fire and heat, water and humidity, like in mechanical impact here, and also like smoke and, and soot. Uh, we have to regard the probability and the frequency of their occurrence. And then we have to multiply it with the amount and intensity uh, of the expected damage here. So the probability and frequency, and here amount and intensity of damage. And if we multiply, uh, multiply it, we have four to four, for example, would be here. If we would have four, four uh, in the amount and three uh, in the frequency, it would be here, like fire, and so on. So, um, It's enough to have here four categories, to be honest, because um, uh, otherwise it makes the things too complicated, in, in my opinion. Um, if we conduct that, we finally get uh, uh, risk categories, for example, here, like the high risk, medium risk, low risk, and mar marginal risk. Just uh, a tip from my side, if you ever have to create such an uh, assessment and to present it, try to bring it in a graphically way on the paper. Use something like that. Use colors. It makes it makes everything clear, and everybody knows fire is the highest threat here. Water cleared. If we have to 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 uh, fight the fire, we do it mostly with water. 
if there is fire and water, most of uh, mostly there will be all smoke and soot, and so on. So um, this is clear. This makes things clear. If you present it, try to do it graphically. Yes. Coming in the end to the monitoring and revision again, it's also this part. Uh, this this is also part of the risk management process because. The risk after um, 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 after calculating the risks, we have to think about what we can do to do a risk reduction and a risk coping via planning uh, and via conduct of special measures. So this is what I told you, um, which you what what you have to have in mind maybe, and, and with, which is interesting also for for monitoring and revision itself. <clears throat> um, you have to define short-term completion tasks and measures. You have to define medium and uh, term completion tasks and measures and long-term completion tasks and measures, which helped you um, uh, minimizing the threats and minimizing the risks. And uh, this is these are steps you always have to take and uh, you always have to do when you do your monitoring and revision process. Uh, and you have also always to, to assess are these, uh, measures you, you define in these three, um, uh, terms, are they, are they appropriate? Do you have to enlarge them or are they senseless or are they worthful? Um, otherwise, um, the, this whole management process, um, is, is for nothing to be honest. Sure. So. In the end, you have emergency planning for cultural property protection. This is always an, uh, um, a, a, proposal, uh, um, a proposition from our side um, that, uh, and always more or less the result from such, uh, from such a um, uh, risk management process that we have to do such a planning. Because as you already saw and you will see, this is how we uh, answer an event. So all in all, it's again very important to um, to have in mind. Risk management is a circular is a circular movement, and with the circular movement, um, you are also able to do the monitoring and the revision all the time. So in the end, to end also the topic here, uh, we have here again our graphic about emergency management, and guess where you find the whole uh, monitoring and revision uh, revision um, uh, part. Yes, you're right. It's not only here. It's over the whole processes here, over the whole phases, because we have to do the lessons learned and lessons identified about how did we cope with the chaos phase after the event? How did we cope with the protection measures, with the safeguarding and securing measures, with the stabilization? Is there room for improvement? Do we have uh, options to uh, to make our processes and our measures efficiently, uh, uh, more efficient and more uh, effective? Um, what do we have to take care for in 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 the res, uh, recovery phase? Is it better to um, store things longer? Is it better to have uh, restorators already uh, um, on place and experts on place when we do this phase? Is it better to have them afterwards and so on? These are all questions you have to uh, have in mind if something if you do your, the monitoring and revision process. And here, the results of doing the monitoring and revision via the uh, doing a risk management process is taking place in a normal way. So use the time, um, as, I did, as I said in the pre uh, presentation before, it's uh, like that, that um, an event doesn't take place every day. It takes place um, where very uh, seldomly, but if it takes place, you should be prepared. And so these processes should be conducted in a quite good way to be able to react to the event appropriately. So this is this is from my side. I thank you very much for your attention. Um, sorry for your attention, yes, but, uh, but also for your attention. And um, I wish you a nice day and have much fun with the rest of the course. Goodbye. <laughs>